Welcome to Film Forum Presents, a podcast featuring special live events recorded at our theater located at 209 West Houston Street in downtown Manhattan. In this episode, Film Forum presents a Q&A from opening weekend of Miles Davis' Birth of the Cool, the new documentary on the life of the jazz legend. The event featured filmmaker Stanley Nelson, whose previous documentary, Black Panther's Vanguard of the Revolution, opened at Film Forum in 2015 to great acclaim, along with Vince Wilburn Jr., Miles Davis's nephew and bandmate, and Lenny White, the Grammy Award-winning jazz drummer who played on Davis's landmark 1970 album, Bitches Brew. Miles Davis, Birth of the Cool, is now playing through Thursday, September 19th. Good evening, folks. Thanks very much for coming out tonight on this gorgeous night. Welcome to Film Forum. My name is Joseph Berger. I'm the events uh, d- manager here at the theater, and we're very excited to welcome you all to the opening weekend of the U.S. theatrical premiere of Miles Davis' Birth of the Cool. Yeah. Uh, you, can, you guys can applaud. It's fine. Um, this film is a remarkable documentary about an extraordinarily remarkable man, an artist, and visionary, and we're Really happy to have with us the director of the film, Stanley Nelson. Hello, hello. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, This is our second day here. Um, We are so excited to be able to present this film. Um, It's just a real joy and a real honor to make the film. I want to thank uh, American Masters and Eagle Rock Entertainment who funded the film. Please tell people about the film. Let people know you're our best advertising. We all walk around uh, with a network in our pockets on our phone, so please let people know. Uh, after the film, again, um, Miles's nephew uh, uh, and also bandmate Vince uh, Wilborn will be here, and, and Lenny White, who uh, is an incredible d- drummer, as we all know, played on Bitches Brew and with Return to Forever and others and others and others. So we're really excited to, to be able to, to uh, talk to you. And so stick around. Again, it's just uh, such a joy. And, and it's so great to be uh, back here at Film Forum because they are incredible, incredible hosts. And, and we're just so happy. This is our second day. The film premiered at Sundance Film Festival uh, in January. So we've been waiting like eight months, I think it is now, <laughs> to, uh, to kind of unleash the film on the world. So. Here we are. Thank you all so much. Folks, please welcome back Stanley Nelson. And our guests tonight, musicians Vince Wilburn Jr. and Lenny White. Come on down. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for uh, coming and for everything. The term clean is used a lot to describe Miles and this immaculate, meticulous way of presenting and tailoring his suits um, and, and, and showing off. And I thought your film is so clean. It's so succinct and um, it's incredibly complicated but not overly sentimental. So again, I wanted to congratulate you on the writing of the film. We talked a little bit about the writing and the choices you made working with his autobiography and all these interviews. Um, so I thought if you'd like to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, for, for, for all of us involved in the film, it was really, you know, just an honor to be able to make a film about Miles. Um, and we wanted in some ways for the, the form of the film to reflect Miles. We tried to put everything that we had into the film and, and to, to make it, you know, our hearts and souls and into the film and uh, kind of uh, reflect Miles, so yeah. And you had, um, yeah. you had audio material that you listened to but ultimately didn't really work with and then you, you yeah, resorted yeah. back to the text. We, we thought that maybe there was a way to fashion a, a narrative with Miles kind of narrating his own, his own life. And, and I, I met Quincy Troop who wrote the autobiography uh, with Miles um, at a party and Quincy said, you know, I've got like 40 tapes because the way that we wrote the autobiography was I would just put a t- tape on the table and, and talk to Miles and Miles would just talk and talk and talk. And I have these 40 cassette tapes of Miles um, and so we got the cassettes from him, and um, and we tried for I don't know six months or so to to fashion a narrative with these tapes. But the problem was that uh, you know he had a little one of those little cassette old style cassette recorders that he put on the table with without a mic. You know he had his own built-in mic, so the sound was bad. 
um, and they would order dinner during the <laughs> during the during the conversation. So they'd be chewing burgers, and 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 the TV would be on in the background and stuff. So we struggled to try because it was Miles's voice, and like so, okay, can we can we make a film with Miles's real voice? And we struggled for a long time, and finally we said, you know, they, they, this is just not going to work. And so we went back to the autobiography and other interviews that Miles had done and fashioned a narrative um, out of that and then had uh, Carl Lumley, the actor, kind of voice Miles and, and, and did it that way. And before I open it up to the audience, I just want to ask Vince and Lenny about the process of being interviewed by Stanley and revisiting this remarkable time in your lives and the emotions that that touched upon. It was great for me. I mean, uh, actually, my brother, who uh, knew Stanley from a mutual friend, said that uh, Stanley's going to, he wants, they want to interview you. I said, really? Me? He said, no, no, no. So they're going to call you. And sure enough, um, in speaking to Vince, uh, they said, yeah, we'd like for you to be a part. And I was just honored to be a part of it. So it was great for me. And sitting with Stanley and Nicole was there. I mean, um, actually, I had gone to a lunch with Nicole and she said, well, like, we'd like to talk with you about, you know, I'm sure. And then sitting, I mean, he made it really very, very easy, you know, so uh, he asked me to bring, what Miles asked me to bring was a snare drum and a cymbal and we sat and talked and it was really cool, real cool. I have to say that that you know um, I, I couldn't show, but I was really nervous, you know, because I have Lenny White albums, you know, <laughs> I have Lenny White albums, you know, with uh, Miles with Return to Forever. I have Lenny White albums by his own group. I have Lenny White albums, you know. So you're sitting there with with somebody like that, and and you know, I'm just trying to be cool and ask ask the questions and and and, and, and pretend like I'm not in awe. But you yeah, know, I just realized I, you're you're, I, you're sitting with icons, yeah, and legends. Yeah, no, it was it was it was it was really kind of crazy. Crazy and and you know I had to I, I just made sure that I had a lot of questions written down so that I could always go back to the questions if I got too crazy in my head about the people that I was sitting down with because you know um, you know Lenny and, and Wayne Shorter and, and Herbie and, and Quincy Quincy Jones and I mean you know it was crazy and for you Vince you had a much more intimate relationship Shit, I was in awe of, of Stanley and yeah, in right. awe of Lenny you know yeah, right. um, right. Stanley has a way of, of and Nicole, they 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 ask the questions, and 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 then, and then you flash back on some, you know, he opened up some sensitive things that I was was um, reminiscing about with my uncle, and um, and it was a lot of crying, but he, I made, I guess it made the edit, <laughs> it didn't make the film, but but the questions were were, you know, Stanley has a way of just getting pulling things out of you, but just like a, a normal conversation in the living room, which it was in the, in my living room. I just want to say before the questions, uh, the family felt really comfortable, you know, and 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 Stanley had a way of s telling the family, hey, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything, you know, I'm not going to make, this isn't a Disney film, this, you know, this is, this is going to be real, you know, and so we just signed the paper, and we didn't see anything, you know, I was trying to give Nicole and Stanley, you know, phone numbers, and this is this word, and Stanley said, if I need it, I'll, I'll call you, just he hung up. Click. So when we got the final link, it was like 11 at night, and, and I watched it for, it was two hours, so it was about one in the morning by the time I finished. I live in LA, in California, and I, I forgot about the time difference, and I was so excited and crying again, and I called Stanley. I said, man, Stanley is so beautiful, man, I love it, I love it, man, I love it. And he said, I'll call you tomorrow, I'm asleep. <laughs> I thought he was gonna like, you know, get emotional with me and talk about the family. I call you tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, the, the family is very proud of, of, of the film that Stanley made. We're happy. Stanley, were you acquainted with any members of the family before? Oh, thank you all. Um, no, I mean, well, we, we actually we actually met. I don't know, maybe f almost 15 years ago, because uh, we started the project, and um, you know, 15 years ago, we talked to the family about it, and uh, then it didn't go forward, and then you know, maybe two and a half years ago. Uh, it, we got started up again. You know, I, I talked to American Masters, and and I, I and they said, you know, we're talking to this company out of England, uh, Eagle Rock, and we just talked to them last week about doing a film on Miles, and I was like, well, here we are. After that, it kind of moved pretty quickly, and um, they came together and put the money in, and that's how it got going again. I understand the early '70s, Miles was uh, rehearsing with 
Tony and uh, Jimi Hendrix, and how serious a collaboration was that? After we had done Bitches Brew, I was playing in a club in New York, and Miles came to the club, and between the break, he came to me and he asked me, he said, do you want to play with Jimi Hendrix? And, you know, Miles was my hero. I had played with him, but I wanted to continue to play with him. I said, nah. And that was the worst thing that I could have ever done. <laughs> but, and, and then in speaking with M. Toomey, M. Toomey said that Miles was looking for a band for Jimmy. They had talked about it, and he was looking for a band. Which I think there are actually a couple of recordings of Tony Williams playing with Jimi Hendrix, but not many people have heard that. Miles is known for adding the directions in music credit to, I think, starting in the mid to late 60s and then through the 70s records. And I was wondering if there's anything you could share, I guess particularly Lenny, but anyone, as to what sort of direction or interaction Miles had with the band and with T.O. in making the edits on Bitches Brew and other 70s records. Well, it's kind of interesting. You know, Stanley, I, I, I must say this. Now, I've seen the, th the, the film three times, and it's fantastic, but what is really great is Miles' music really runs through this film and makes it. And, and I see people, I, I, I was doing it, I see people in the audience when certain things come up, they go, and they start humming the solos. You know, so like it's really deep that this music really goes through a lot of, 1949, when I was born, I was born in 1949, and that's Birth of the Cool. 10 years later, well I'm what, 11 years old or whatever, there's Kinda Blue. And see, it's interesting because in 49, Miles and Gill gave us a new uh, vision in how to take jazz music and whatever other kind of classical music, whatever, and do that. And so for that 10 years, that was something that inspired musicians to do it somewhat that way. Then in 1959, Miles does it again with Kinda Blue. And in Kinda Blue, there's modes and there's things now you have a new way of doing it, and John Coltrane comes into his own, and that so, so for those 10 years. And then 1969 happens again, where Miles changes it, and he includes the other kinds of musics that are around. Before that, it was jazz. It was different ways to play jazz, but in 1969, he included all these other kinds of musics that were going on at the same time, and there was a new truth. This was the way to do it. In the studio, there's all these musicians that I had heard of and had made recordings, and this is my first recording. And so Miles comes to me and he says, think of this as a big pot, like a stew, and I want you to be salt. <laughs> now what musical knowledge am I going to <laughs> play on to play like salt? <laughs> so, you know, the fact is, is, is I learned how to create music before I learned how to play it. And Miles didn't give, he gave a lot of direction, but no direction. Again, that kind of direction, be salt. <laughs> and on Miles Runs the Voodoo Down, you know, like, Tony Williams was my drum idol. And so the fact of the matter that Miles had Tony Williams in his band, so I figured that that's what he wanted. But he was moving in a different direction. He wanted some funky stuff, you know. And I, I probably had played more funk music in the ghettos with the clubs than anybody on the record. So he says, Miles from the Voodoo down there. And so I'm playing my Tony Williams and Jack is playing his, and we're going. Miles said, no, no, no. You ain't getting the chicken. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had outthought myself. I thought that that's what Miles wanted, but that wasn't what he wanted. And uh, uh, Don Elias says, hey, Miles, I got this beat. And he came up with this real simple, like, New Orleans second line beat. 
And I was like, oh man, I can't believe it. I couldn't. So I wound up playing percussion on it. So like when the session was over, and I was kind of over in the corner, like you know, and Miles comes over to me. He said, "What's wrong?" I said, "Man, you know, I got this opportunity, and like I didn't." He said, "No, no, no, no. Be back tomorrow. It's okay." So he kind of gave me grace to do that. And as far as direction was concerned. Again, there were little notes and things that he said this, but he didn't tell anybody what to play <laughs> at all. And there were no, f no photographers, there were no pictures from that session, there's nothing from that session. Max Roach was at the section though, and uh, there was an, I was another idol, and he was there, I mean, I was like freaking out. There's Miles Davis and Max Roach, you know. But uh, there was hardly any direction. Is that the same experience you had, Vince, working with him? I mean, it, it was, it was, it was. At the end of the day, at, you know, we we would record during the day, and then we would take the tapes to Uncle Miles, and and then he would make notes, and then tell Tio what to do, you know, the next day. So that's where you get the directions of music by Miles Davis. But you did that with Bitches Brew yeah. too. Yeah. Right. But but shout out to Tio because Tio was very important on all those recordings also. But it is directions of music by Miles Davis. We all know that Miles was very, very proud, and he was not interested in ever going backwards. But I want to know, Stanley, if you have found any of the footage right before the Montreux concert from Le Vallette in Paris. This is about a week before that Miles did a concert and had invited people like Sonny Rollins that he had played with in the 50s and the 60s. And they did this concert. It was a fantastic concert. I was not there. I had to leave to go to a concert that I had to play in Vienna. So I missed that concert. But I wanted to know if you've ever found any of that footage. Nicole, uh, who, who was the producer of the film and did a lot of the, the research for uh, the archive stuff, said um, that, that there, is, there is footage of that. You can find, probably find it on YouTube. I think our decision was, you know, um, you know, we wanted to cover one concert or the other at, at that point because, you know, it, it was kind of we've already, you know, Miles is, is not well and we're kind of headed toward, towards the end. And so, you know, um, uh, uh, just in, in terms of story, we wanted to uh, cover one concert or the other. So we chose to, to cover the concert uh, with Quincy um, for obvious reasons. But I think there is footage of that. I know there's audio. We all hear about Miles and the good side and the bad side and the Jekyll and Hyde. But I want to know from you, besides the music, as a person, as a man, as a brother, what did you love about him the most? Miles was Superman. I mean, they talked about that in the film. For me, a young kid coming up in the ghetto who wanted to play music, um, Miles was Superman. And for me, the opportunity to meet him was great, but I didn't, I always said to people, I said, man, I didn't just get the opportunity to meet Miles. I got an opportunity to play with Miles. And it's, it's you know, my brother's sitting behind you, I and mean, he can tell you. For me, it was earth shattering, but he was a, a role model from the perspective of, you don't necessarily have to do what I do, but watch what I do. Matter of fact, he was playing at the village gate and he took me upstairs to hear Les McCann and his trio. And we'd sit and he'd say, you see that? Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you see that horn player? He can't play nothing. Look at his posture. And, you know, he would talk to me about music and about musical things which is really great. And, you know, I, I was afraid of him because he was my hero. And people, when you get, you, there's a show on uh, Amazon Prime called the, the, the Guys. It's about superheroes. And then you find out that superheroes have flaws too. 
But the fact is, he's still a superhero. And he didn't show me flaws. I mean, I might have seen them, but that still didn't change him. He's Miles Davis. And for me, he was a hero and always will be a hero. I just wanted to say thanks for making the film. I'm a fan of your work in general. I always look forward to the next one. And when I heard this was happening, I was really excited. So thank you. Uh, just briefly for, uh, and it's good to see everybody on the panel. Uh, for Lenny, since you're a primary from that era that was playing with him, I just wanted to know what your opinion was uh, the source of some of the, um, and I apologize if it's an outdated question at this point in time, but this is my first time seeing you in person. Uh, what is your opinion about some of the misinformation about the music from that period? Because um, even now it seems to be described as a generic concession to industry forces, but that music was so creative that was always an odd assessment. You could even call the music avant-garde in a way, but in a holistic way that it was drawing from all these sources. So um, do you think there's some avoidance in talking about that, especially from the 69 to 1975 uh, period? Truth is always hard to take. And as I said, I thought in 1969, uh, what happened with Bitches Brew, there was a new truth revealed. I mean, you know, Miles had revealed truth two or three times before that. But there was a new truth revealed, and that is what, like what Miles said. He felt as though rock and roll musicians didn't know how to play, and this was his way to sh show that he could have the greatest rock and roll band in the world, and nobody in the band was a rock and roll musician. I think, again, what was so hard to take is when you expose truth, I mean, you know, people that have been living lies, it's kind of hard to take. So you think about all of the music that came after that time period. I mean, you know, jam bands. That I mean, Bitches Brew was the first jam band, ambient, whatever kind of music you want to say after that that came after that. That was the first to do that. I mean, Miles started using percussion in his <laughs> bands. That was, I mean, you know, there was no synthesizers on that record. You know, so it was a very interesting point because things were changing. Uh, I think that things were happening in America that were changing and artists usually were reflective of all of the things that were going on. Um, I would have liked to have seen up to this point a little bit more of a description and uh, talk about that. But I think Stanley's film does that really well. Matter of fact, this is the film that does that better than any other film that I've seen talk about that. And, you know, uh, so I have to applaud Stanley with that. This is the right way to do that. Thank you. First of all, I wanted to thank Stanley. I've seen uh, films, documentaries on Miles. This was a gargantuan job. You covered it in a soci sociological, cultural, and historical context, and it was so emotional. And Vince and w Lenny, for your participation, it was fantastic representation of the genius. And Lenny, I always wanted to ask you, are you playing on Spanish key? Of course. Okay, because the, the wait, wait. bass drum, the bass drum was so brilliant. I wanted to ask you for years. Was so brilliant on on that with the bass, and it just gave it such a thrust, you know. Well, but here, here was my point. The fact is, I had a methodology, and I said, okay, there's four percussion players, and two drummers, and I mean two drummers and two percussion players. And I said that what I wanted it to sound like, what I wanted to make it sound like is one drummer with eight arms. Right. And so the fact that you didn't, you asked me that question, I did a real good job. <laughs> <laughs> because I am playing on there yeah. and you didn't know that I was. All right. <laughs> and, yeah. and also on Sanctuary. On Sanctuary, I saw some uh, um, things where they had personnel. And they only had Jack as personnel on. And that's not true. 
I mean, if you listen to it, uh, I'm on every track with the exception of Miles Runs the Voodoo Doll. And I told you why I wasn't on that track. Yeah, yeah. And I'm playing percussion on that track. Right. But Don Elias is, is playing um, drums on that. I mean, yeah. you got to understand, that's the first record th that I made. I was there. I tell you, everybody that's on there, I'll tell you who's not on there. But the fact of the matter is that that made an indelible point for me. And yeah. yes, I'm playing on Spanish. All right. And, and, and I thought hey, it was. I and Lenny got, and Lenny got the chicken on all the other songs. He got the chicken, right? And the salt. Can I just say one more thing before we go? Um, thank you all so much for coming. Please, you know, uh, let people know. Tell people we're here for two weeks, all day, every day, day just like. Avengers Endgame, whatever the name of that thing is, you know, so we're here all day, every day. Um, please let people know, you know, this is the best tool we got to communicate with people. Let people know that's the best advertising we have, okay? Thank you all so much for thank coming. Thank you, guys. Please. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for listening to Film Forum Presents. Special thanks to Abrama Rama and Firelight Media for making this event possible. If you like what you just heard, please be sure to subscribe to get future episodes and rate and review so that more movie lovers can find us. Film Forum is an independent nonprofit cinema and our doors have been kept open for nearly 50 years thanks to the invaluable support of our members and donors. Please visit www.filmforum.org for details on membership as well as information and showtimes for our current programming. See you at the movies.